Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to Cut the Shit, a podcast series that aims to take a closer look at the impact of the IT industry, both the good and the bad. Cut the Shit is brought to you by Plow Networks, a managed IT services company based just outside Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Brian Link, COO here at Plow, and I'll be your host for this series. I'll ask questions, and with the help of our guests, try to dig deep on some of the key challenges we all face dealing with IT. So with that, let's cut the shit and get started. On today's episode, I am super excited to have my fellow Plow colleagues, Ryan Harris and Andy Bass, as my guests today. Ryan is our Network Services Practice Director, and Andy is one of our Senior Network Architects. Prior to joining Plow, Ryan and Andy worked together for a pretty good while, so Plow is a getting the band back together sort of deal. And as I think you'll see, they seem to be making pretty good music together. During our conversation, I spend a lot of my time trying to get them to share their different perspectives on how the business side of the house can best work with engineering and vice versa. Regardless of where you sit in your company, hopefully their back and forth will give you some insights and thoughts on how best to understand those crazy engineers or those crazy business types. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Ryan and Andy. Ryan, Andy, welcome to Cut the Shit. How are you guys doing today? Hey, yeah, pretty well. How are you? Doing okay. Doing okay. Um, we're on the same team, obviously, but we're not in the same place. Ryan is clearly in the office. Andy is clearly at home, and I'm in North Carolina. So classic hybrid, remote, new world kind of deal, right? And that's the beauty of networks is that we, you guys, I shouldn't say we, that's presumptuous. You guys do the work <laughs> to make this kind of stuff possible. So thank you for that, um, and uh, we appreciate it. Um, before we get into the meat of the discussion, uh, how about we start with each of you giving us an example of the most interesting use of technology or a hack that you've seen or heard about recently from clients, colleagues, personal, could be anything, maybe even your own, you know, something you've experienced yourself. And I won't, uh, I won't necessarily call on you, but um, if you're ready, fire away. And if you interrupt each other, we'll deal with it. Um. I'll start. Uh, so I have um, uh, at, at the house, I've got a um, media server that houses um, TV shows, movies that uh, is all the stuff as, you get off BitTorrent. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, obtain, it's obtained in, a, in some fashion. Um, <laughs> OK, so. Uh, I, I had to, as soon as it got out to like family that I was, I had this, you know, uh, it's called a Plex server that uh, I was, I had media available on, like everybody started asking me like, well, you know, can I, can I access it? And so <laughs> my first reaction was like, oh, sure. I don't care. Yeah. Have at it. Um, it, it became uh, pretty uh, quickly apparent that like, oh, these people are now streaming 4K video out of my house, which is competing for everything else that my kids want to stream 24 <laughs> hours a day. Uh, and more importantly, probably my wife, who was like, why is the internet so slow? Um, <laughs> I so, thought you were a network guy. Yeah, like yeah. your wife's like, I thought yeah. this is what you did this for is, a living. Right? This yeah. is kind of like a like a cobbler's shoes thing, like yes. like the network at home that <laughs> so anyway it became readily apparent pretty quickly that like i gotta do something about this so um i had to kind of get creative in how i let uh family members and friends into my network uh to stream video while also just not like making it available to the entire world right so i've got a firewall at the house but with Plex, like it runs over specific ports so that you have to get creative with the way that you do like port forwarding and you have to do some one to one natting. But I can't really do that because the people I'm sharing this media with don't have static IP addresses. So those IP addresses are changing. And so I had to like come up with this. I say all that to say this. I had to come up with this extremely wildly over complex uh, conditional like essentially a conditional rule that basically breaks uh, people outside of our network's connectivity via a firewall rule every 30 days. And then I have to go in and check to make sure that those IP addresses are still assigned to the people that I want to have access into the network. So like every month I have to do this review of yeah, okay. who has access so, to our network. So you're a better friend than than I would be. Um, so I just <laughs> we'll just we can we can establish that up front. Or maybe you're just, you know, mini Netflixing and you're charging people for this. Although 
I don't know that I'd advise that. You might run yeah. into some some yeah, some legal issues some at some legal point. Ramifications yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Now, Andy, you've had time to think. What uh, what oh, springs boy. to mind? I know you're an audiophile. You've got like you're, you're a technical guy, so you, surely something has come across your desk there is, lately. Well, in the same sort of vein, um, there's a whole host of what I would call uh, non-commercial sort of regular protocols, like uh, a uh, uh, plug-and-play protocols that a lot of consumer electronics rely on to you know talk to the firewall open the right ports none of those protocols are really supported by what you would call smb or enterprise firewalls so getting those to work because i for a long time i had a cisco router um floating above my internet and yeah getting that to work yeah no (laughs) that's gonna require a lot of custom configuration um just because, yeah, you know, business, what do they need UPnP for? Um, so, well, it's yeah, interesting. I was, I was sure that Ryan was going to say that the most important, impressive hack he had seen recently was buying a jumpy house for his kids so that <laughs> he could get some uh, free, some quiet time on the weekends. And Andy, I was sure yours was going to be some magnificent beard treatment um, <laughs> to keep that thing in check and to keep it as cool and smooth as it is. So I was over two on what I expected from you guys. So we're off to a good start. Um, all right, let's get to it. Um, to get it started, if you'll give us a very quick snapshot, I, I've asked a couple of guests this and it can go long, quick snapshot on sort of your your background, sort of how you got career-wise from where you started to here. Again, a couple minutes and and then we'll kind of and then on the back of that i want you guys to tell me how you guys got to know each other because i know that your relationship this little bromance proceeds plow <laughs> so i want to hear about that so andy why don't you give us your background ryan you follow him and then you guys can tell us about the uh the the relationship we're just past valentine's day so it's perfect <laughs> oh wow okay so i came to nashville uh, to go to vanderbilt and then i stayed and i stayed and i stayed quite a long time, ended up with a PhD in engineering. But part of that in order to get me through was, you know, started working in IT, um, engineering, IT, a mm, little bit of overlap. Computer engineering um, or what What flavor? Network engineering. Network well, engineering, okay. Mostly uh, at that point, more systems, a little bit of network, but much more systems and programming. Okay. Um, so I kind of dovetailed into the PhD a little better, um, but sort of, started to like that and so from there i went to a consulting company um and we were doing forensic financials forensic investigations a lot of high-tech security i went down to enron worked on the enron estate for a little while um then came got kind of tired of traveling came back uh worked in nashville started to get more into the network and sort of transition more from systems to network. Uh, And then I uh, moved over to a small little ISP, uh, which is where I met Ryan. Gotcha. All right. Uh, So Ryan, uh, that gets us to the, to the bromance side. So you pick, you, you pick it up and go backwards from, you know, kind of get, give us your journey to there. Yes. So out of school, I went to work for a company called Carlex Glass. So Carlex Glass was an automotive glass manufacturer that did um they're here locally um big into uh, windshield side glass um so i started out uh, there as essentially just a network administrator um the uh the it manager who was there um was on his way out the door with uh in regards to retirement and um the uh, our cio at the time kind of came to me and said hey do you want to just slide into that role um, up until that point, I wanted to just stay on the engineering side. I never imagined going into the management side. Um, but, you know, as a kid out of college, like it was a whole lot more money than I had ever made in my life. And so I was like, OK, this, this, this how, how big okay. not, not to get not to interrupt, but how big was the team? Um, so it was four people at the time, and okay. that's including myself. So basically three other uh, network uh, technicians. So. Okay. Um, that was my first foray into management. I stayed there for almost, uh, 
six years, uh, which is where I left there and went to uh, an ISP here locally where I met Andy. Gotcha. Okay. So you guys were both at this little ISP together. What was the nature of that? Uh, what were you were you guys working together? What was the status at the beginning? I'm sure Andy hated me when I came on board. We're oh. going to get to that. We're going to get to that. So hold on to that <laughs> thought. Yeah, that's that, that's that's part of this discussion. Yeah. Um. Uh, so, go ahead. Go ahead, Andy. No, please. Yeah. So Andy. Um. So our kind of the nature of. Uh, Andy was um, kind of the the chief architect or engineer, you know, chief engineer um, when I came on board and already had an established team, established processes. I mean, things were kind of on the engineering side. They were well established. Um, uh, I originally came in to manage the network operations center there, um, which had seen some flux with guys moving in and out and nobody really they couldn't really find any leadership there so um i came in to manage the network operations center um and we were essentially andy and i were going to work as peers me on the operations side day-to-day management and then andy on the engineering side the architecture side so gotcha. um that, that that's kind of how that's set up and andy how big was the team at that point on your side Oh, it varied a little bit, but uh, two to three other gotcha. folks. Okay, okay, perfect. So fairly small teams, so that's very yeah. transferable, I think, in terms of the nature of most of the folks that we work with and probably a lot of the people listening. I mean, we may have some people that work in really big operations internal, but in general, most of the customers that we work with, right, have smaller internal teams. That's part of why they're outsourcing, right? Is Or maybe mm-hmm. those, maybe that's the other way around. Maybe they outsource. And that's why their teams are small. I'm not exactly sure what the <laughs> how the causal error works there. It doesn't really matter. Um, and you know, we could keep going down the. We could. I'm, I have no question there'd be some interesting war stories and probably some stories you could tell on each other uh, over the course of <laughs> of time. But how long were you guys together at the ISP prior to Ryan you coming over to to Plow? What Andy six years. Five or six years. Okay, yeah. so good, so yeah. good, a good stretch. So five or six years had a chance to work together, didn't kill yeah. each other. So that's always good. Um, <laughs> and then Ryan came, uh, came to Plow and was able to talk you into coming, coming over to this side, Andy, from wherever you were uh, mm-hmm. at that point, right? Okay, so that kind of gets us up to today. So let's transition a little. Um, I want to talk some again because you guys have been working side by side, but with different hats and different perspectives, right? Very different skill sets. Ryan started as an engineer, so understands that role, but again, not in the same flavor, not certainly not in the same way that you have been working, Andy. So that's there's there's a gap in his knowledge relative to what you do and vice versa, right? I think that's probably fair to say. Yeah. Um, with, with that as kind of a backdrop, and from, from your perspective, Andy, I wanna start with you. What is the biggest issue you've seen in working kind of as an engineer or as the head of engineering in in an ISP setting or IT operations and setting that you, what's the biggest issue you've experienced in working with the ops side of the house? Oh, probably just difference of opinion on priorities. um, I would say I am kind of much I would like to solve more problems uh, rather than manage problems. Um, And it's not an absolute, just sort of um, more of a sort of I'm more weighted to that. And uh, and that's not always the case for everybody. I mean, there's always, you know, everybody sees a slightly different scope, some some broader scopes than others. uh, And there are a million priorities um yes. so okay that's know, fair some, that's fair sometimes you know sometimes it's better to add one to the management pile and sometimes it's better to take the problem off and spend a little bit more time in solving it that's just sort of my um preference okay uh, and okay. sometimes you know that's not other people's preferences right ryan so flip the question what, what's been your biggest issue in working with engineering yeah, so it's uh, it's actually uncanny that he uh, Andy said what he said because I would have given the same answer. And just so we're clear, we've not 
we've not heard these. Yeah, we didn't discuss this so We've had no way yeah. to rehearse this. Well, no, because um, I wrote the questions about 15 minutes before the interview, before we got on the call. So there's no way you could have seen the yeah, questions. I can guarantee so you that. <laughs> it is it is it is absolutely um, priorities. And I kind of think of it as if you want to use a medical analogy, like Andy is typically a surgeon who wants to fix a problem and then not deal with it again. And uh, I tend to be more on the managing problems as like a family doctor, right? Like, let's, you know, we'll, we'll manage this problem and it's going to be an ongoing thing. Um, I think it is, uh, it, it is the hardest thing is comp competing priorities. Um, you know, engineering has a set of priorities that they want to, uh, uh, that, that tie to goals that, that they want to accomplish. And then we have a set of, you know, I, on the operation side, I tend to have a set of priorities that we want to accomplish. Um, uh, and so I think trying to meld those two, it, it, sometimes we butt heads on what, you know, what need, what work needs to be done in what order. Um, I think that's the hardest thing to try to overcome. And, and that seems like a natural tension, right? That you're never going to get away from, right? Because I mean, you're engineering what you're representing in terms of solving problems there, right? It that that translates to other areas that don't have engineers, right? You get the same yeah. issue uh, across the board, um, and you know, the business value is often difficult to to calculate, right? I mean, it's not always easy to say, well, it's worth X to solve it at the root, right? Yeah, just like it's not easy. It's not it's not always easy to say you're leaving money on the table if you manage it. Right. So that's a I mean, that's the art of the of the game, so to speak, that is a constant a constant trade off. So, you know, with that, you know, with that kind of as the backdrop, right, and given those obvious differences and a little bit of focus and approach, you know, Andy, question for you, how does engineering do its job within the constraint constraints you get from the business operations side of the house? Just an optimization problem. I mean, when it's, you know, you negotiate as, as, to the best of your ability and that's what you have to deal with. Um, and, you know, it's whether it's, you know, sort of automation, whether it's, you know, uh, adapting a design, whatever the, the end up, it ends up being, um, you know, that's that's kind of. You know, if, if if the decision is made that this is a manageable problem, then, you know, OK, so be it. Move on. Um, OK, because otherwise it's just, you know, you just charging a windmill. Well, and, and does it raises another question for me, which is in your mind, where do engineers what, what role do engineers have to play in setting those constraints and and do is having a seat at the table helpful? Uh, and, and if so, to what extent, right? Because at some point a decision has to be made, right? You, you know, we all like the kumbaya to think we come up to come to consensus on on you know every decision. The reality is it's not how the world works. So, you know, where where does engineer? How do you see it playing a part? And 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 what do you think makes sense there, given your experience? <laughs> um, that's a hard one. It really depends on how technical your leadership is. You know, sort of whether you want you know, an engineer at the table or whether that engineer can be represented by uh, a manager or a, a more senior business uh, person. Um, but, you know, sort of the job of engineering is is basically to be as clear as possible and to make the uh, choices and consequences of those choices understood by management. But it's fundamentally a business and it's going to be fundamentally a business decision. So, so with that, Andy, I'm going to keep going with you, Ryan. Hang on, you're, you're, you don't, don't get bored. You're, you're going to come back soon. Um, in your perspective, is there value in not being an engineer and running ops, or vice versa? And kind of, what are some pros and cons? I mean, you've had some different experiences, I'm guessing. So, sure, uh, and some of it depends on scale, right? When you're the, the smaller your company is, the less specialized you have, the more sort of lines get blurred. Um, so if you're talking about larger companies, right, where engineering tends to have a much tighter focus on just engineering, that's a bit different than a smaller company where there's going to be overlap and engineers are going to be concerned with operations because, you know, for nothing else, operations doesn't like to be woken up in the middle of the night and engineers don't like to be woken up at, for an escalation in the middle of the night either. Right, um, right. Makes sense. So there's, you know, there's a little bit of work balance there, 
but um, engineers are there to sort of guide you to a, a technical solution to a business problem. OK, that's fair. Yeah, so I mean, there's a variety of things in there that, you know, defining a business problems, right, that we're trying to solve. Yeah. Right. Ultimately, that's a that's a prioritization question. If you want to call it that, that's a market fit question, too, right, because we could be great at solving problems that nobody cares about and we won't have a business, right? Yep. I mean, that, that's yep. certainly possible and, and actually happens all the time because it's not that easy to actually know what the problems are that people have. I mean, we tend to say, oh, our customers have this problem or that problem, but that, assume, that, that makes a lot of assumptions, right? That we have the problem defined correctly, that we understand it, right? And that the solution really is, that they even understand their own problems. Because sometimes problems are, you know, multi, they're multi-dimensional. They got all kinds of different things going on. So that's another whole podcast. We can deal with that another <laughs> time. So um, obviously, you know, we work with customers uh, as an outsourced IT service provider. Most of our customers have in-house IT operations, even some engineering, it depends, right? It's a mixed bag. But thinking of that audience, let's translate, let's let's pivot a little bit and take the lens in looking at at other operate, you know, other folks, other other com- customers that we work with and that we know well enough to have some insight into what's going on in there. Um, and Ryan, I want to start with you on this. Where do you see problems emerging between the business side or the ops side and the technical team? from your perspective, again, as you look at it from the outside in, because a lot of times it's easier to see problems in somebody else's shop than it is your own, right? That's it's always, that it seems to always be the case. Yeah, I think the biggest problem that, and, and I don't know that it's necessarily a problem. I think the biggest challenge that we see now is, um, and we see it especially in enterprise organizations, is really two things. One, I think that there tends to be a pretty um, large disconnect um, between uh, the operations group who is focused on service delivery and the engineering group that is focused on um, solving business problems, like Andy said, with, with, with technology. I think that gap exists in the operation side of the house, understanding um, the the level of work required to deliver a solution to fix a business problem that an operations team can then uh, manage on a daily basis. So what we tend to see in that is you have an operations team who is focused. Um, operations team tend to be much more focused um, than an engineering team does. And I think that a lot of times that that is because you know, if you're familiar with a, uh, a book called the Phoenix Project, um, they talk about there two there's there's two of the four types of work are planned work and unplanned work. Um, engineering groups tend to be uh, the victim of a lot of unplanned work um, in the form of escalations. And I think that within those large enterprises, um, operations the, those operations team don't tend to uh, understand that when there's unplanned work that goes up to engineering, that takes away from their ability to do planned work. And while those operations team expect that that unplanned work gets taken care of, whether it be in the form of escalations or or, or whatever, um, there's still this expectation that the planned work is getting done in the same time frame with or without that unplanned work. I think that's the, one of the biggest challenges is is for operations groups understanding that when you leverage those engineering teams for unplanned work, that planned work suffers, right? And so those timelines may slip, the delivery dates may slip. I think that kind of making sure that your operations teams understand what the effect is um, will go a long way in creating some efficiencies down the road. Makes sense. That makes sense. Um, in that context, what what advice do you have to the engineers in that scenario? Um, you know, I think that um, engineers, uh, by nature, want to solve problems, um, and so w- I think there are a lot of engineers that thrive in a setting of playing a hero role and getting to fix things uh, that that other people can't fix. Um, I think that we are seeing the industry and I think that we encourage um, even the, the, the clients that we work with um, to essentially uh, 
use that engineering knowledge to create usable process and procedure that can be pushed down, whether it be in the form of run books or process improvements or efficiencies, use that engineering knowledge, maybe take it in, you know, cut it into bite-sized chunks and, and, and put it into, um, uh, you know, small processes that can be delivered to the operations team to try to keep that um, unplanned work from you know to a minimum, right? right? Let's let's try to reduce that by twenty percent or thirty percent or whatever it may be, by utilizing that that engineering knowledge and kind of pushing it down to the operations team. And and Andy, and from your perspective, what you know, what what advice would you give to the business operations person who's listening to this from engineering's perspective, right? Hmm. Yeah. No, I I fully agree with what Ryan said about scheduling, and and scheduling is always been kind of a black art there's there's certainly a, a statistical nature of it you know if you if you're big enough and have done it long enough maybe you have uh, good data on you know sort of how much escalations and other non-planned work will take on a uh, typical man month man week kind of a basis and and can plan for that um but yeah, engineers engineers do like to solve problems. Engineers uh, should be encouraged to distribute those that information as well, um, because the one thing that you can't have in engineering is is sort of one guy that knows it all, uh, because that will either, you know, that person can step in front of a bus. That person needs to go on vacation. Right. And the business has to continue on. Yeah. Um, I think that's a good that's a good cautionary tale, I think, for everyone to remember, particularly our customers who have smaller shop, you know, smaller in-house teams. You know, there's the old military saying about two is one and one is none. And this yeah. is a perfect example of that. Right. That that's there's a lot of inherent risk um, that people have in smaller, you know, small. And these are most of our customers are not small. They're, they would be considered midsize. But oftentimes we're talking hundreds to even thousands of employees that might have an in-house IT team of, you know, it might be six or eight, but of those eight, like four or five are literally, you know, service desk folks. And the sort of the, you know, the higher skilled folks are solos, right? And and that's because you don't want to pay for two. You don't have two people, you don't have two person, you know, two man hour totals worth of work to do. But then yep. you got one guy who knows everything, and we're using guy because it's let's face it, it's mostly dudes, right? That is the truth. Um, you know, it's one guy who knows everything about your freaking network, right? And so, and and how many times do we see that, right? And in many ways, we're yep. part of the reason we're we're involved in some companies is to mitigate against that, right? And well, and I think that we yeah. get we get pulled in a lot of the 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 opportunities that we get pulled into are as a result of after the guy. Has left and they're right. in a bad position because they don't. Nobody knows anything, right? Like not, knows he didn't write anything yeah. down, or he wrote <laughs> yeah, down like exactly. you know fifteen percent of it, yeah. and something happens and nobody can, nobody can get to the printer. I'm just using that as a joke. That was from the <laughs> conversation we were having before the call. So, um, yeah, sure. Um, well, and Andy, you, you mentioned it. You know, the idea of being able to have some idea of some statistical analysis to to estimate. You know amount of time that might take for unplanned work and that sort of thing. And those are often averages with big, you know, big standard deviations, big which causes yep. problems, right? Because any given week, it might be a whole lot more, a whole lot less. But over time, it hopefully would add, a, it would, it would average out. Um, thinking about that, or, and I'm not sure if there are, but are there any tools or systems that you guys are using now or have used that you think helps bridge the gap between these two sides, particularly around sort of the unplanned versus planned work or clarity of of prioritization and business problems um, that that you're being asked to deal with. Hmm. I don't know that that I know of any great specific tool recommendations, um, but it is any, anything that lets you get, you know. Data on you know how long and and sort of time time tracking and and whatnot uh that that you could enter in and and actually turn that into information um i think yeah it's so i mean in our case we're thinking of a ticketing system first of all let's go basics right the ticketing system at least has the potential 
to help you glean a lot of insights about the work that's going on, right? Yep. I mean, we, we yep. would start there. Does something like Avic, a monitoring system, does it does it provide any value in this scenario, or is that more just for for visibility into the? I mean, I don't know. It's more of a maybe just a dumb question, but was curious about as you think about the actual monitoring systems themselves. I don't. I mean, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's just I, I think that there's some value to be gained there. I don't know how much. I, I don't know how much it offers in a sense of, you know, kind of time tracking. Um, I think that it does help in auditing so that we can, you know, it gives us a point of correlation between the work that was performed and, you know, the, the a time tracking mechanism on the back end to ensure that, you know, kind of from a change controls perspective, we're, we're, you know, work that's actually being performed is actually being tracked over here. Um, so. I think it does give some value. It does have some value there. And it's in conjunction with the ticketing system. I mean, to sure. your point, you're, yeah. you're saying it without you, they go together like peas and carrots, as Forrest yeah. Gump would say, right? So I would I would say that, that it's it's an indirect value to the concept of time tracking, right? In that your monitoring can let you know um, what, what are problem areas and things that are being escalated. So you could maybe concentrate on, you know, designing better run books from the engineering side to pass down to operations uh, all the way to, okay, this is a, uh, a problematic circuit. Um, and this is costing a lot of money in escalations and unplanned work. And maybe we should uh, try to replace that or at the very least uh, change it over if, uh, if the contract is coming up. Got it. Yeah. And I think I, I don't want to fall in love with time tracking. Time tracking can be dangerous because you could have somebody spending a lot of time on something that they're wasting a lot of time. Right. To your point around problem solution or, or root cause solution, as opposed to just, oh, well, you know, we need to reduce the amount of time we're spending on unplanned work by 10 percent. I mean, maybe you could do that by using a little, you know, using a little higher order thinking around where are we wasting 10 percent of time currently because we've got a problematic circuit or, you know, some configuration challenge, you know, problems that we could probably spend some of that time on to, to fix and it'll take that 10%, you know, off the off the plate immediately, right? It it can get dangerous to fall into time tracking. It's, and yeah. especially if you're selling time, which we don't we don't sell a lot of time. We, we don't we bill by the hour for some things, but that's not really our business. But that creates weird incentives. If uh if there's uh you know if you if you're paying by the drink, so to speak, for per hours, it's funny how hours seem to you know, increase, right? That's just the normal way things work. Um, and Andy, I'm assuming in your consulting business, you probably saw that if maybe you guys were doing flat fee engagements, but if it's per hour, right, you can, you certainly pay attention to that and you start to count the minutes, right? That's the game. So that's, yep, yep. Absolutely. All right. Well, listen, I've kind of get, let you guys, uh, you know, kind of, I've kind of grilled you a little bit on this. We'll, we'll kind of wrap it up. Um, I, one last question on kind of this piece before we move to this couple of personal experience questions. Um, and, and Ryan, I'll let you start and let Andy bring us home. You know, from your perspective, as you assess the current state of the relationship between operations and engineering, you've been doing this a while and you've sat on both sides, on the engineering side for a bit, kind of in the in the knock side and then in the management side. Do you think it's better than it's been? And and if so, why? And if it's worse, why? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know that it's worse. Um, I think there are new challenges. Um, I think that, you know, it, it, I think, is it better? I think that there are tools in place today and there are tools available that allow us to um, communicate more efficiently. Um, I think the biggest, you know, one of the biggest hurdles that that engineering and operations have faced thus far is, is communication. Um, I, there's a lot of collaboration tools out there now. Um, there's a lot more visibility in the networks, which allow us to collaborate uh, and communicate more effectively. Um, so I definitely think it's easier if you have the right pieces in place. Um, I think uh, a lot of that is driven by leadership. Um, I think that you have to have the right people in place that understand. It certainly helps um, when you have leaders in place who have been on both sides of the fence because uh, there's an understanding of, of, you know, the engineering side and then the operation side. I definitely think it's 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 better. Um, I think a lot of the tools and uh, that that are available today uh, foster a sense of communication that allows things to to 
to be more effective and to for for people to use their time more effectively. Andy, your perspective. I think it's it's the roles have changed, right? This industry is is crazy fast evolving. Um and and the roles have changed and especially when you get sort of uh down to the smaller markets, right? Um, there's a lot of overlap between engineering and operations. Um, you know, I've known some some senior operations people who were quite frankly better than junior engineers, um, right? And so it's it, it's one of the challenges would be um, sort of defining where that boundary is between right. engineering and operations. Um, yeah, it's but, definitely a blurred line, and 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 mo, yeah. you know, most in most businesses, frankly, and I mean, you'd be really damn big line for it not to in be in a lot yeah. of different businesses, for sure, for um, sure, right? And but you know, I don't, I don't know that it's necessarily any worse um, than it's been in the past, in the recent past. Um, but uh, yeah, it's you know, so much of it, especially on the small teams, is is just personalities and communication. Right. Yeah. And those are universal. Those are universally uh, difficult problems. Right. I mean, you yeah. guys identified the three things you identified pers- uh, priorities, right, communication and personalities. Right. And let's face it, those are all aspects really of I mean, the priority side is not really human driven in the sense of the people that work there, but it's in relate in trying to relate to the market, which is ever changing. And there's lots of unrevealed preferences inside a market. So it's hard to figure out priorities in terms of matching to customer needs and predicting the future about what you ought to do. Right. Everybody, and let's face it, no one can, we, we are all terrible at that. We're, we're just yeah. trying to feel, we're feeling around the dark. We're doing the best we can. <laughs> and then on the communication side, right, there are more communications tools now for sure. There's also a lot more noise and finding signal in that can be tough, right? Or over communication that leads to lots of multitasking and makes it actually hard to get work done. So communication can sometimes be a barrier to, you know, good work. And then lastly, personalities, right? We're all humans and trying to get people figure out teams to work well together is especially when you have natural tensions baked in engineering versus operations business, you know, that's a that's a that's not easy to do. If you can do it, it's like magic, though, man. It it makes it it makes it great. Which I'm guessing is why yeah. you two guys keep working together because you 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 like to work together and you get along and you make things. You know, it it makes that part of the process. You take that off the table, which is really nice. So, all right, with that, let's uh let's wrap up. Um, I'll try to close out the inquisition now. Um, again, as I said, I always like to kind of wrap with something personal, sort of personal experience. So. Uh, Andy, go first. Tell us something you've watched or read lately that you think others ought to check out. Oh, let's see. Um, it doesn't have to be technical. It can be, but it doesn't have to be. So I, everybody I talk to these days is talking about chat GPT and uh, and the AI and, and, you know, will the AI take over and, and you know, whose jobs are in jeopardy and, and whatnot. So, um, it's it's certainly interesting to look at, um, and it gets a little bit technical in terms of AI and general intelligence and, and whatnot. But it is fascinating in terms of uh, its ability to be a better search engine than yeah. uh, than That's a good way other phrasing, commercially available. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Ryan, how about you? Um, yeah, so there's a, a book that uh, I just finished recently um, called uh, The Metaverse um, by a written by a guy who's pretty heavily um, into uh, he's a part of a VC um, that does a lot of tech investment, um, essentially talking about, uh, you know, kind of this theory of the metaverse and how it, it, it none of none of it and part of and, and and what it is 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 actually real and how this kind of internet of things is becoming this all kind of all singing dancing metaverse which at one point you know kind of the internet is at an arm's length right now but it, it, eventually it will surround us and in, in kind of everything that we do and it's kind of already started that and um it's, the, the book is actually pretty terrifying when you like try <laughs> to process everything that it's talking about but um i think it's fascinating from a sense of uh kind of giving real world examples of of 
just in the last probably 15 years, how rapidly things have have kind of he, he calls it connected to the Internet. You know, everything that everything in our lives now is connected to the Internet in some form or fashion. And and how uh, the, the I would encourage anybody um, who's even remotely interested in technology to go out and read it. And, and Andy would appreciate this, and I'm sure I'll get this wrong, but I know there's some formula about a network, and then and when you add a node to it, there's some relationship to the value of that network based on the number of nodes that are on it. Something along those lines, if I remember correctly. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but something it makes sense, right? That a network's got more nodes, it's more connected, it has the potential for at least the potential for more value, right? And so if you this is this is that to the nth degree so to speak right where yeah. everything and you know everything is a node so to speak right and it's connected to every other every other node as opposed to a sort of a client server old school model you know um horizontal and vertical so interesting um all right last question uh ryan i'll let you go first and let andy close it out tell us about your first technology memory as a child um and since you guys are different ages this should be Ooh. interesting um <laughs> And it can't be the telephone or TV. That's boring. So. God. No, um, first technology memory as a child. Um, so, OK, yeah. Uh, so when I was in, um, I think in fourth grade, fifth grade, uh, I was in a program called Seek which is like, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar, Seek is basically a program for gifted children. Uh, I think it was like students expanding. He just wanted to tell us that. Knowledge. Knowledge. See, that's, yeah, it's, just a, it's a subtle flex. Um, anyway, so. Uh, it was really a special needs class. <laughs> just, that's yeah. it, where he, they, they told him that. So, yeah. yeah. So um, I was in this program called Seek, and we got really, that was the first experience I had with a graphing calculator. Um, so I think it was like a TI 83 or something like that. That was the first real experience with technology because like I could like plug my headphones into it and like I could do, I could play games on it. Um, and which probably got most of, most of the use was me playing games on it. Um, uh, or spelling the word boobies, um, upside yes. down. That was yes. kind of part of it. Um, I think that was my real like first kind of introduction into like um, technology per se, because I think from there I got really interested in handhelds and then like, uh, you know, natural progression. And like I had a CD player, right, which was, you know, awesome. And um, so I, th I think that's probably the first like real memory I have of like uh, some kind of technology gadget. OK, Andy, how about you? Wow. So, yeah, I would say similar time frame. So it was definitely primary school. Um, we were in a school that had, uh, I'm sure that was a grant, but they had Apple IIs, right? And then there was, there was, a, you know, sort of everything about that from the mundane of, uh, what do you mean? I can take this regular floppy disk and just a hole punch and punch it on one side. And like, now I can use the other side of it, the store as well. Like, Two for one, like just with a hole punch. OK, that works. Um, and then just sort of the joy of of programming and, and you know, right. You know, Apple II, it was basic, but, you know, it, you know, full color TV screen and, and yep. uh, trying to figure out at that young age, you know, basic turtle graphics and, and things of that nature was just yeah. it was great. It was a great experience. Yeah, cool. Well, that's. It's funny that you know, there's similar stories. I've asked this question to a lot of people and and I've gotten some crazy different answers, which is always fun. Um, but there's some there's some a lot of similarities, and particularly I've noticed around age ranges, um, particularly Andy. And I, I don't know how old you are, um, but I'm 52. And and a lot of people of my vintage that in that first interaction with an old Commodore 64 or an Apple II mm -hmm. connected to the TV, you know, writing some stupid little basic program and watching it build a picture of a circle with a, you know, arrow <laughs> through, you know, something, I mean, today would just make my children laugh out loud, <laughs> but they also would be fascinated because they have no idea how to program because the user interface is, it's so abstracted now yeah. that the idea of actually coding something is, you know, that was the only way to get anything to do anything then, right? There wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't yeah. like it is today. So it's better for the user, but it's also, you know, makes, 
I mean, no offense, but my kids think engineers are magicians, right? They because they don't, <laughs> they're not engineers, and so they don't under they they've never been exposed to it. There was no, yeah. there's very little DIY at this point the way the way it was then because that was the only choice, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, yeah. uh, that's and I'm sure know, the folks that are you know ten years older than me would say the same thing about you know modern systems, you know PDPs, Altairs, all of that. Yeah, we used yep. to wire wrap those boards. Like, yeah. but you, and you going back, you know, people are like work reliable on, hardware. You guys have you guys are spoiled. <laughs> right. It worked on erector sets or or radio kits. Like that's you know, that was yeah. the yeah. you know yeah. how stuff how mechanical stuff worked, right? That was a, you know, that's kind of taking it a step back. So anyway, we'll wrap there. Um um I've I, I can't, you know, as a as a principal of the company, I have to make sure you guys are actually working. So I'm gonna let you get back <laughs> to to doing what you do for our customers. Seriously, guys, I appreciate it. I enjoyed the conversation. Andy, yeah. um, it's always fun to talk to you. Uh Ryan, we talk all the time. So I uh, can't get enough of that either. But I appreciate what you guys do for the company and thanks for sharing uh yeah. your thoughts with the cut the shit audience. You guys have a good day. All right. Thanks, Brian. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, we'd appreciate it if you would become a subscriber wherever you get your podcasts. And if you could rate and review the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, that would really help us out. Or you can just go old school and tell your friends, your family, your colleagues, and hell, anybody else who you think might want to hear something like this to listen in. If you're on social media, make sure to follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at cuttheshit underscore pod. We are also on TikTok at cut the shit pod, all one word, where we post lots of clips from the podcast. And last but not least, you can also watch the YouTube version of the show on our YouTube channel at plow networks until next time. Take care and have a great day.